film Jailhouse Rock, Elvis Presley's character, an up-and-coming rhythm musician, is in a scene where he's cornered by some self-ordained professorial types who view him as a fascinating specimen and react by bombarding him with some real off-the-cob, straight-from-the-fridge jive about jazz, which gets old E's dander up because they were over-intellectualizing the music and he, someone who was a totally instinctual musician, can't dig their crazy, egg-headed gobbledygook, flips his wig and beats his feet away from the freem scene. In that scene, some shape in a drape says, Brubeck and Desmond have gone just about as far with dissonance as I care to go. Bearing in mind that this was 1957, it just shows that the byword for Hepcat jazz of the late 1950s something a little too cerebral for Dizzy Gillespie's mugging, but more approachable than the coolier-than-thou thousand-yard stare of Miles and Train, was Dave Brubeck. And surely his most famous song, known universally for its melody if not for its name, is the Dave Brubeck Quartet's Take 5, a ubiquitous cultural artefact reputed to be the biggest selling jazz single ever, and considered not entirely accurately, to be the song that broke 4-4 four, four, and 3-4 times stranglehold on popular music, Take 5 was actually made more than remarkable and actually significant when considered in the context of the excellent album which bore it, Time Out, which was released in December 1959. Time Out is something of a concept album based on the rather abstruse concept of each song featuring a different, often shifting time signature. Like Kind of Blue, it comprised entirely of original material which was still relatively novel for jazz, reliant as it was on standards in the Great American Songbook. This was a big departure from Brubeck, who had a long-standing reputation as a populist musician, who did however occasionally unpopular things with standards. But it was the previously unheard rhythms which still make things novel and highly influential. Brubeck had studied under Darius Malaud, an avant-garde composer in the 1940s, who introduced him to variant time signatures from classical music. Malaud turned out an even more famous student who specialised in frequently bizarre time signatures in the popular idiom, one Bert Bacharach. Brubeck had been, as the guests at the Elvis Soiree demonstrated, a famous musician for some time by the time of Time Out. He'd been on the cover of Life magazine in 1954 and had been a prolific recording artist, especially for Columbia. So keen was Brubeck's ear, the story is that he managed to bluff his way through of Mills's College's music program before anyone found out he couldn't read music. He learned everything by ear and he learned fast. The alto saxophonist, Paul Desmond, the man who wrote Take 5, was a much more light-hearted character than Brubeck. He was once nominated by Charlie Parker as his favourite altoist, but in his self-deprecating style, pointed out that had there been actually an award for the slowest altoist, he would have won it every year, with a bonus award in 1961 for being the quietest. Desmond and Brubeck worked together for about 25 years and developed a very close bond, despite being polar opposites as people. Desmond, the hard-drinking, multiple chemical-dependent, womanising practical joker, and Brubeck, the studious, religious, devout family man. Desmond with his free and flowing style and Brubeck with his notoriously knotty piano pounding ways and his tendency to treat even the most banal song subject as a chance to expound on some obscure theory that was interesting him at the time. Together, their music moved in a figure eight, at points in the cycle far apart and chaotic, but always converging on a single point of inspiration. Well enough scene setting, so let's look at what's in the groovy grooves. For all its dry intellectual pretensions, you know, 
Time Out is actually an album of songs. Well-written, wholly formed songs whose solo sections just happen to be songs within themselves. Opener, Blue Rondo a la Turk in a mind-melting 9-8 time fuses swing and Balkan folk music into a Turkish delight, swinging back and forth between Brubeck and Desmond, which fills the first two minutes before Desmond and bassist Eugene Wright settle into a warm swing, working their way through a typically sunny-toned Desmond solo before Brubeck returns with his dazzling piano figure to close the song out. Strange Meadow Lark, a wondrously delicate piece, is mainly in 4-4 but opens with a free-time solo from Brubeck, which is probably viable as a standalone piece. Brubeck then later solos in free time over a solo 4-4 swing. The famous Take 5 is next in its pulsing 5-4 time drummer, Joe Morello setting out a busy groove for Brubeck's two chord vamp and Desmond's hypnotic floaty solo. If I have a complaint, it's that it goes on that two chord vamp and a not eventually particularly convincing drum solo for about 2 minutes 32 long, but then I haven't heard the hit single and this may well be attended to. If it's dissonance you want, then 3 to get ready has it in spades. By my count, this is in 7-4 time and alternates very quickly between Brubeck's ornate neoclassical melodic phrases which open the songs, some cool little moments where he swings it hard and even adds a very bluesy solo where he really belts the keys, and Desmond's sweet sounding but Coltrane influenced solos. Apart from Take 5, this is probably my favourite song on the album. Kathy's Waltz is one of the cleverer songs on the album, rhythmically a little similar to 3 to Get Ready, but ups the game by switching between 4-4 four, four and a double waltz time 6-8, with Brubeck and Morello acting as twin pulses for the song. I'm tempted to think that Brubeck's rather ornate playing here is him just having fun, switching between styles and motifs, including something akin to rock and roll as he does. Everybody's Jumpin' is a difficult song to listen to. Not that it's unpleasant, there's plenty of oral candy going around, especially from Desmond with his solos and Brubeck's bluesy obligados, but it's the almost sloppy rhythm that makes it difficult but fascinating. They say it's in 6-4, but there are parts that feel 5-4 and 4-4. For a point of reference, if you, um, if you know the Beatles well, you'll know songs like Getting Better, or being for the benefit of Mr. Kite or happiness as a warm gun, where they frequently chop and change time signatures and beats through multiple sections of the songs. It's similar to that. But in Everybody's Jumping, all the rhythmic rumble and royal is disguised by a jauntiness and some wrist-racking triplets from Brubeck. Pick Up Sticks is the most straightforward song on the album, a driving 6-4 which reiterates the purpose of the whole experiment. What makes music jazz is that it swings. And as the quartet proves here, it can swing in six time or seven or nine, just as hard as it can in four. But all this time traveling across the 12 inches, that's the high concept and it doesn't mean to get in the way of what is essentially a terrific set of tunes and some barn burning playing, which merges the fast fading cool jazz style with the hip west coast sound to create a music which is light, and heavy, dreamy, witty, almost liquid, yet punctuated with bold statements on the piano, and thrives on the intricacies of the melody, the new time signatures, the dynamics of the ensemble, and the virtuoso playing from Brubeck, Desmond, and Morello present. It is immensely pleasurable, though, just for what it is. Given Brubeck's career before and after, especially his aforementioned reliance on dissonant chord voicings and famously heavy-handed piano technique, it's a noteworthy coming to understanding for a major musician. And as Jazz's first million-selling LP and spawning Jazz's first million-selling single, it was an artifact that unified an audience and crossed significant cultural and artistic boundaries. It's a music that in its cool and carefree passages speaks to the aspirational zeitgeist of the late 1950s, of the optimism and of the confidence of the individual in society. But it's not just jazz, it also opened the door for the prog rock boom of the late 1960s by legitimizing these variant time signatures. 
and in its going forward into uncharted musical territories. And trust me, there is terra incognita a plenty to be opened up later in this series. It showed the spirit of the art to be as alive in the decadent new world as it was in the reverent old.